Welcome to our PRBI live session. Today, we host PRBI member Paul Furiga, President and Chief Storyteller, WordRide PR, to discuss the finer nuances of entrepreneurship in PR. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Paul has over three plus decades of experience in various forms of communication and is passionate about storytelling. His passion for storytelling inspired him to form WordRite in 2002 and to write a book on the importance of storytelling in business, Finding Your Capital S Story, which publishes in fall 2020. Uh, be sure to pick it up. Under his leadership, WordRite has grown into Pittsburgh region's largest independent PR agency and is a perennial top ranker in the annual O'Dwyer's national rankings. It has also become the region's go-to crisis agency. In any given year, the firm handles 12, at least 12 major crises. Two of them make the news and probably 10 that do not. Uh, his firm has been awarded several times by reputed organizations for their work and has also appeared in PR news books as case studies of excellence. Uh, but you know, uh, to keep an agency not just running, but on top of its game, it takes courage, perseverance, and vision. Paul will share with us today his experience and insight on how to become a successful PR entrepreneur. So let's hear more from him. Hi, Paul. How Hello, are you Karen G. Thanks for doing this. I sure appreciate it. How are you doing? Doing, doing great. Doing great. Uh, it's uh, summer here in uh, Pittsburgh, and that means uh, temperatures that almost approach what we have on a bad day. In Bangalore, <laughs> uh, though it's it's wonderful out here in Bangalore. It's raining and it's beautiful. Good. <laughs> yeah. So you know, before we take a deep dive into the exciting PR entrepreneurship, uh, I would like to hear a little more about you on how you got into PR, because I believe uh, you spent a good amount of your time in journalism, and typically we see journalists move into copcom roles but not really PR, so why PR? Well, that's really, uh, you know, I, I gave myself this title Chief Storyteller and, and I really do like stories and that's a story. So what happened was I'd spent uh, two decades in, in PR and I was editor of a business newspaper here in Pittsburgh. And at that time it, it was part of a large company and I'd been told that I was gonna be promoted and moved. But I didn't, they said, we don't know where, where you're going or when, but we know you want to go. And at the time, my wife and I had two small young children, two daughters, and uh, we had family here in Pittsburgh. It wasn't originally from Pittsburgh, but we had family here. And we really didn't want to leave. So I started looking around town, and one of the people I knew uh, ran uh, the largest uh, PR office in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, a firm called Petrum, which is a global firm. And uh, I asked him to help me and quietly find something. Called me up one day, said he wasn't going to help me. It was the day the paper came out, so I'm on the phone with him, and I'm rifling through the paper looking for a reason why we wrote something that upset this uh, PR uh, professional. And right. after a long pause, he had a great sense of humor. He said, why aren't you going to ask me why? I'm not going to help you. And I finally said, okay, Larry, why aren't you going to help me? What did we do wrong? He said, he didn't do anything wrong. He said, I don't want to help you find another job. I want you to come work for me. Wow. I had, I had never thought about that. Uh, <clears throat> journalists often have uh, sort of a contentious relationship with PR professionals. Uh, sure. They love some, they hate some stories. They love some stories they hate. And I, I had that sort of uh, feeling, but I also had a sense that good PR sure. would be about good storytelling. And it's not the job of a journalist to help organizations improve their story. That's what right. PR professionals do. And so I made a commitment to myself that if I went into PR, it was going to be all about helping people improve their stories. Right. And how did WordRite happen then? Well, so I was at Ketchum for about four years. And in the early aught, as I guess we say now, uh, there was a, a dot-com sort of explosion, and right. um, the the firm shrunk quite a bit. And I, I was one of the people who uh, was uh, let go. And in early 2002, I started networking uh, to figure out what I would do next. <clears throat> I thought right. that um, 
having been in journalism and having been at a PR agency, I would go, as you said, in, into corporate communications. And as I network with people, the basic response I got was what a dumb idea that was, which unnerved me greatly because I still had two small children and uh, a spouse and a home and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one of my good friends said, well, are you, are you asking people why they're telling you this? And I said, no, that's a good idea. I should do that. So I went back to people and said, okay, you told me not to go into corporate communications. Why? And an interesting answer came back. And that answer was because you should start your own agency. And if you did, I would hire you. Brilliant. Yes. I think that speaks highly about, uh, you know, the professionalism that you would bring to the table. Well, exactly. And, and uh, you know, public relations is all about relationships. That word is in the name of our profession. And I, humbly, I think that that's really an illustration of that, that there were folks who who valued the relationship they had with me and felt that there was something that I could bring to the table by having my own firm. Nice. So what are the core values that you decided to, you know, uh, imbibe in Wordrite? Well, that's a great question because values are very important to us. And, and we have five core values at, at Wordrite. And uh, they can be abbreviated into the name of the capital city of Egypt. Uh, okay. Curiosity, authenticity, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, in a, collaboration, authenticity, intellectually curious, uh, resourceful, and optimistic. And I can certainly define those for you because we have definitions for each one of those that are unique to us. Please go ahead. So uh, collaborative, uh, everything that we do in an agency is a team effort. Right. So uh, we look for people who work well together. And as you mentioned in your introduction, we do a lot of crisis work. And a lot of times people will be doing other things that they need to pull together in just a very short amount of time and work together on something that they weren't going to be expected to work on uh, earlier right. than that. So collaboration is very important for that reason, and also because that's how some of the best ideas come together. Authenticity. As I said earlier, journalists often have a dim view of public relations professionals. Many of them feel that it is our job to lie to them. It is not. Especially today, as the media around the world continues to shrink because of changes in technology, and now it's the coronavirus, the mm. job good public relations professional is to assist journalists by making sure that the good stories get out there and help the journalists by presenting them the information they need to make an independent judgment about whether a story merits coverage. And that requires authenticity. You need to be able to have relationships with journalists that allow you to have a frank conversation. And you have to be willing and this is another definition of authenticity to understand that not every story that you bring to a journalist is going to result in them writing about it or broadcasting it. Uh, Correct. You know, that's something that's very important. Of course, being intellectually curious, we, our clients turn to us to know what should I do next? What's new? What's, what's, a, what's a brilliant idea that you have? And that comes from being intellectually curious. And that rolls right into being resourceful because in right. order to bring your intellectual curiosity to life with ideas, you have to have the resources uh, to be able to come to the table and bring those ideas to life. And finally, optimism. So we're not talking about uh, la la, I see rainbows and unicorns everywhere. We're talking about a time like this, for instance, being able to remain focused and committed and to believe that there's a better place that we're driving towards even though in the small sense you might be dealing on a difficult day with a difficult story or a difficult client situation, or in the larger sense, you know, you're dealing with coronavirus. Correct. So, you know, I've been looking at a lot of interesting posts that you guys put up on your website as well as all your social media. Um, there is an underlying message and you stay, uh, you know, you focus or stress a lot upon storytelling, right? Yes. Uh, for the benefit of our viewers, what, according to you, makes a great story? Well, that's a great question. Uh, so there are three elements to a great story. Uh, number one is authenticity. So right. we talked about that a little bit. Let me give you another definition of authenticity. 
If you and I are in a major downtown and we yeah. see an auto accident, but you and I are on different corners of an intersection, mm -hmm. we both saw the accident. But your view is slightly different than mine. Now, right. are you right and not? Am I wrong as to what happened? No. We, we both saw the same thing. We just have a slightly different view. So a lot of times, especially in contentious public issues as a public relations professional, you are representing the viewpoint of one group or one side, if you will, of the story. And that's right. okay. But what's important, that that story needs to be rooted in fact. Right. So if you think about the auto accident example, you know, to, to go to the public uh, marketplace of ideas and say, I didn't see an auto accident, it wasn't an auto accident, that's not authentic. But to say, okay, I, I saw this and I thought it was this person's fault, and you saw from the other corner that you thought it was the other person's fault, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's the way life happens from a household to inside a company uh, to the greater universe. The second thing is you need to have a fluent storyteller. And this is where a lot of companies really go wrong. They immediately put the CEO out there as the person sharing the company's story. Maybe that's not the best person. Great example would be a tech company. To make the tech company larger and successful, you need a professional CEO. But maybe it would be better to have the person who invented the product or service out there as the storyteller, right? Because they're passionate about it. They understood the problem and the reason for the product or service. They're not the person who's good at being efficient and running an organization. And the last yeah. thing very quickly is you have to continually read your audience. And this too is where many PR programs fail. Because what happens is people get in a room and they have a great idea and they just throw it out there. And they don't look to see, is this what our audience wants to see or what they want to hear? Is this the experience that they were expecting? You have to be continually engaging with the audience to make right. sure that they're a part of the story. Right, understood. Uh, you know, those are very, very good points. And I think uh, PR professionals who imbibe that within their storytelling will be greatly benefited. Um, so I'm going to move the conversation a little bit towards entrepreneurship in PR, that being the subject of conversation today. Um, let's start with your journey in entrepreneurship, right? I'm assuming because you were working, you know, you were an employee at different organizations before that, and this being your first stint in entrepreneurship. How has it been so far? Well, it's been great. Uh, I, you know, a lot of folks think that, uh, the safest kind of a career path is to work for a large organization and then you don't have to worry about uh, the vicissitudes of life, you know, things okay. like uh, natural disasters, et cetera, et cetera. But what I found is exactly the opposite. If you really are interested in being a master of your own destiny, being an entrepreneur is the way to go. Uh, the only person who can fire you is yourself. Now, the flip so, side is the only person that can make sure that you remain employed is yourself. So, you know, every day you, you, you get out of bed and, you know, you put your shoes on and comb your hair and it's another day for you to demonstrate success, right? And I'm being a little bit flip, but, but that is one major difference. Now, in terms of the profession, being an entrepreneur, there's uh, some other great benefits. So if you're a really creative individual, and you believe you have great ideas, probably you're not going to fit well into the conventional wisdom, right? Because I mean, it's just human nature. What we're attracted to are things that are different. And really, if you look at the history of public relations, right, Taranjit, I mean, that's where a lot of the success has come, is from people engaging in unusual campaigns, coming up with creative ideas. Large organizations tend to suppress those kinds of efforts. So being an entrepreneur allows you to bring those ideas to full flower and fruition without somebody saying, that's not the way we do things here. The corporate office will never go for that, et cetera, et cetera. It's a typical response. Uh, so how big is the team right now? We have about 10 people. And uh, it's, uh, it's a good size. 
despite the coronavirus, we've been able to hang on to our team. And I, I, I would say that uh, despite the world environment, um, this has been one of our most creative periods in many ways. That's that's brilliant. Uh, but I do understand, you know, I run an agency myself. It's not easy uh, no. keep home fires burning, right? I'm sure you've had your ups and downs as well. Would yeah. you become sharing with our viewers about your biggest highs and biggest lows and your best learnings on that? Oh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, one of the things that happens with a, a boutique agency, uh, you, as I said a couple minutes ago, you have the opportunity to be truly creative and right. to do some things maybe that a larger firm wouldn't do. So we've been able to do things, uh, come up with creative ideas, and projects, and programs for a wide variety uh, of clients. I'll just give you an, an example right now. And uh, my colleague, Robin, she may even be watching this Facebook Live. But, uh, you know, pizza is a very popular uh, dish in the United States. And, and we have a, a, one of the larger regional uh, pizza restaurants as, as a client currently in Pittsburgh. And we're in the middle of this pandemic, and only a certain number of people can eat in restaurants. Right. And, uh, how can you be creative, right? So just in the last two weeks, uh, there's a gooey dessert concoction in the United States called s'mores, which is mm. it's basically melted chocolate and graham crackers. And right. somehow our client has managed to create a s'mores pizza. Wow. And in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, Robin and the team put that out into the marketplace of ideas. We've got more coverage for that. I just, I can't believe it. And then <laughs> on that, they've got, uh, I think it's about eight locations. Regardless, uh, the follow on idea that we collaborate on came up with was giving eight people free pizza for a year. And that also is getting a crazy amount of attention. And, and these are the kinds of ideas that perhaps in a larger organization, somebody might say, oh, that's a dumb idea. You know, why, why, why would you put chocolate on a pizza? And who wants to do something like that? Um, or it's the worst time to do it because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. But it's been very successful. And, you know, we've been in business for 18 years. I, I could go on and on on great ideas like that. But I think a current topical one is a good example. Now, on the downside, uh, as a smaller firm, uh, it's great to have a big client, but there have been a few times in our history where we had clients that represented a substantial percentage of our business. And yeah. uh, for a variety of reasons, on more than one occasion, those clients have left us. And that's very, very challenging. And we've worked hard to avoid that. So we try to have no client represent more than 20% of our overall business. It's always tough when a client decides to leave. Yes, very definitely. Very. Definitely. And I'm, I'm sure the pandemic must have, you know, uh, you know, changed the game or thrown a spanner in the works for you as well. Uh, what has been a tough? What has been the toughest moment for you in the last three months? Well, nobody knows what's going to happen with the economy or the the health of global society. So. Right. Uh, in the past, when something's happened in our industry, there were other places you could look to to figure out who's doing better, what are some approaches or models that would help us to improve the situation. Uh, across the globe now, no matter where you look, things aren't so great. Um, right. Even countries that have been doing well on the health side, like New Zealand, I saw just the uh, day before yesterday, they've now got a few more cases coming in after being virus free and all this has an, an impact on our business and the kind of clients who work for uh, even in uh, pittsburgh pennsylvania we're affected by um, global events right correct um so um has the structure of your agency changed uh, because of the pandemic are you looking at reinventing yourself um how how has that impacted you no oh, that's a great question and the answer is yes so we're now approaching what uh, one of the industry experts that we follow, Blair Enns, uh, he's, he's from Canada, and he, he's written several books, the, uh, Win Without Pitching, and the most recent one is called Pricing Creativity. And right. uh, there's all about uh, agencies and how to do better work as an agency. 
And Blair is, is promoting, especially given the coronavirus, what he calls the Hollywood model. So, so think of a large film. The mm -hmm. production companies that actually do the film may have a small number of employees. But in order right. to make the film, they may, over the course of 18 or 24 months, hire hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people to do right. the planning, the production, the shooting, the post-production. So if you, right. if you think about our business, uh, designers, uh, strategists, illustrators, videographers, there are many people who are freelancers or work in small shops and work essentially, you know, in the States, we call it the gig economy. They move from one project to the next. So with social distancing and the economic impacts of the coronavirus, this model has been accelerated in our thinking. You know, if we have a small team of committed strategists and we bring in the people we need when we need them to handle the execution, we think that that's probably going to be a better model going forward. Yeah, but PR agencies typically have shied away from this kind of a model earlier because of a lot of confidentiality involved in our business and the confidentiality agreements that we sign with all our clients. Do you think it is going to, you know, uh, be adopted at large by the PR industry? I, I can see advertising and digital agencies working in the yep. Hollywood, which is a great term, by the way. Uh, but do you really see PR industry catching up on this? Well, I do, actually. And I think that's what's going to separate the winners from the losers. Now, between the lines, I think what you're asking is, <clears throat> among the marketing disciplines, public relations and uh, pros, and, and, and you know, in, in, in our global network, PRBI, we have a lot of senior communications expertise right we are typically talking to ceos and mm -hmm. people in the c-suite and we are having conversations that many of our marketing brethren uh, don't have uh, about corporate strategy and certainly for example in crisis this model is not going to work as well necessarily as it will for a consumer campaign or rolling out a new product or rolling out a new service. But by and large, that's what the industry is. Although individual firms may be more crisis focused or less crisis focused. And even those firms, there's aspects of the work they do where that sort of a model will be appropriate. But you are correct. There's certain things that we do, uh, especially as experienced PR professionals, you can't outsource those. Correct, correct. I still see, uh, you know, a lot of people taking up, uh, you know, having virtual offices everywhere, yes. employing people, uh -huh. uh, and just bringing in consultants, like you mentioned, only for, let's say, B2C campaigns, rather than uh, crisis management as such. Yeah? Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in our firm, and you mentioned earlier on, we, we do we try to do a good job with social media. So we want to do more with social media and video would be one thing that we want to do more with. We've had success uh, working with talented young people uh, yeah. who've done project work for us. And I see that as a perfect example uh, of a part of our discipline that can be effectively outsourced to freelancers or, or small related shops rather than have somebody full time on your payroll in your office who may not be as busy all the time because that's not the primary focus of your PR agency. Correct, correct. But as WordRight, I, as, I, you know, I've seen you guys do a lot of innovation. Uh, you've launched a podcast, you have a video series happening, and plus you also run the Pittsburgh 100, if I'm not wrong. Yes, that's correct. So tell me a little bit about how uh, you know you manage to keep innovating year on year. Is that part of the overall uh, marketing plan that you have for WordRight? Yes, it absolutely is. And uh, a big part of that, you know, we talked briefly about the core values. So it's mm -hmm. critical to have people on our team who buy into, agree with, and advance those core values. So we right. have a team of curious individuals who are very very resourceful and you know there are certain words and phrases that i'm getting tired of because of coronavirus like the new normal pivot 
But I have to say that's the right word. Our mm -hmm. team has pivoted very strongly. And mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Two of our clients relied heavily on in-person events. And right. we had expertise in doing webinars. And, and the team, uh, we had discussions as a team. They said, you know, we really need to be going back to the clients and recommending more webinars. And we right. did. And those webinars have been very successful. Now, we've been in this coronavirus pandemic for six months. And maybe people are getting tired of going to webinars. I don't know. But with two of our clients, one a financial advisory firm and another an accounting firm that has a very specialized expertise, we've had great success working with them and taking events that used to be in the real world into the virtual space. Uh, right. the financial advisory client, six weeks in a row, we did a webinar, which I have to say, frankly, not being on the team, being the CEO of the agency, I was very concerned that that was too much. But we had hundreds of people show up for these webinars every week for six weeks in a row. Brilliant. I believe if the topic is relevant and uh, you know it's relevant to the audience, they'll always show up. If it's providing value to them, they'll always show up for it. Yes, yeah? I, I agree. And one of the great things about webinars is you can do what we love to do uh, in, in global society today, which is time shifted consumption, right? right. You know, I, I have an app on my phone that allows me to watch uh, TV programs. I have a DVR attached to uh, my, my cable box that allows me to do time shifted viewing. And webinars are great because they're time sh you can time shift the consumption of those as well. Brilliant, brilliant. But I want to hear from your perspective as an entrepreneur. You know, how uh, typically, let's say, if I have 100 employees, right, I can divide them and say, yeah. you know, every month or every quarter, I want you to come up with something new and drive it. But you are a boutique firm. How do you manage to keep innovating and keep driving that with your team? And you have 10 people, right? But the yeah. uh, amount of innovation, it's not directly proportional to the amount of people that you have. What's your secret? Well, one of the great benefits of having a small team is everybody's able to be innovating. Everybody has a voice. You know, right. I, I worked in a large agency, and I love my time at Ketchum. It was like getting an advanced degree in public relations. Ketchum is a wonderful organization. However, right. it's a large organization, so it is prone, as is any large agency, to bureaucratic inertia. You have to have mm -hmm. a certain title in order to be allowed to speak at the table right. and share your ideas. That doesn't happen in a small agency. Any person in a small agency has the ability to share their thinking and provide their perspective. And, and that's what's enabled us in large measure to be able to uh, innovate and to be creative. Anybody can walk into my office or today, anybody can use the online platform Slack and say, hey, Paul, I have an idea. Or to one of their colleagues, I have this idea, let's try it. And, and that's really been a great source of our innovation. So with all the innovations that are happening, has the ask from your clients changed? Have you been ever approached with a new you know, pitch which says, I want only the new stuff that you're looking at doing, <laughs> traditional stuff. Well, it, very interesting because uh, a, a, another principle, let's call it, it's not one of our core values, is, you know, we often say to clients, you shouldn't spend a dollar on your public relations or marketing unless you know what kind of results you're going to get. So that's, that's where we start, right? So we start from the premise that new is great and it's exciting, but don't do it, just do it because it's new and exciting. Do it because it's new and exciting and it's going to get you better results. And measurement is a, is a critical aspect of what we do. Now, that said, if clients are getting results from doing things a certain way, sometimes they're reluctant to try something new and something different. And uh, one of the things, and again, this is not a core value of our firm, but everybody on our team possesses it, is persistence. Right. Uh, I mean, if I had... Uh, a dollar for every time that it took us two years of working with a client to finally sell them on an idea. Oh my goodness. And you know, typically what happens, Taranjeet, is you, you finally get the client interested in this idea that you've been talking to them for about two years and, yeah. and it's great success. 
that tends to happen. But you're right, it takes a lot of persistence to make that happen. And yeah. you mentioned an interesting point, measurement, right? That's, I think, one of the holy grails for all PR professionals. Yeah. And agencies are able to, I think, evolve that much faster as compared to bigger giants out there. Uh, how do you deal with it, uh, with all the new innovations that you're bringing to the table? Do you work backwards from, you know, when you have an idea and say, uh, this is how we are going to measure it? How do you measure success there? Well, it's exactly as you said. It's important to, to work backwards. Uh, you know, as our profession has become more and more digital, we are doing much more digital work. Now, earned media is never going to go away, but as the traditional media continues to, let's just say, evolve, some people would say shrink or implode, uh, the importance of getting measurable results has only grown. You can measure everything on the internet. So a lot of even our more, more traditional public relations efforts now are focused on delivering a digital outcome. So even just something as simple as a press release We'll want our clients to have a call to action in that press release and, and also to drive the intended audience to perhaps a specific URL on their website and to take some action there that's measurable. So, you know, you don't want a press release that says go to the company's homepage. Well, that's where everybody goes is to the homepage. You want to drive them to a specific URL so that you can say, on the client side and on the agency side, look, this URL appeared only in one place, that's in the press release. So every single person who came to your website and hit mm -hmm. this specific page did so because right. of our PR efforts. Brilliant. So tell me something about, you know, uh, some of the toughest campaigns that you've run out there. Well, without a doubt, it's it's the crisis work that, that we've done. Um, mm -hmm. You okay, know. so one example of a crisis that uh, did not make it to the papers. Oh, uh, wow. Well, there are a lot of those. <laughs> you know, the, the numbers you shared at the beginning or, you know, we sat down one day and, and, and tried uh, to, to figure it out. Uh, so there, there, oftentimes there will be uh, dispute situations that involve uh, – a lawsuit or something like that, and right. uh, you expect it to become public, and it and it and it ultimately doesn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, because it settles. Sometimes that happens because it turns out that what the individual was alleging to be wrong turns out not to be true. Now, what often happens, and we see this in the world today, including on social media is that somebody can get out there and say something and it could be yeah. incorrect and it could still do a lot of damage before it's disproven. Correct, correct. Okay, so let me move a little bit on the positive side of what's happening in the industry today. Your proudest moment as an entrepreneur in PR. Well, I, I have to say it's, it's uh, the success we've gotten for our clients by being innovative and, and creative. And, you know, I gave you a couple of examples with uh, our, our pizza client, but, but also it's, it's our team, uh, the people we brought together, the people who are on the team now, and many of the people who've worked for us over the years, it's been nearly 20 years, and to see yeah. where they go on and, and what they do, and then to meet up with them and to see that their time at WordRight, focusing on what we call the capital S story, and learning about storytelling has continued to carry through in their career. I really, truly do believe, especially the brand of story crafting that we've developed, which is our trademark process and storytelling, the capital S story, are, are unique ideas and fundamental ideas that if mm -hmm. more of us who practice public relations were focused on that kind of storytelling, we'd have more success for our clients for ourselves, and also for the people that we need to reach, the stakeholder audiences. Yeah, true, brilliant. You know, if more of us focused on storytelling, uh, it would be a different perception out there. I Absolutely. You know, human life is all about storytelling. Before we had a written language, there were storytellers in almost every society going back to the beginning of human civilization. 
you know, you know cave paintings and a variety of other things as evidence that we've been storytellers because it's hardwired into our brains. And the more we get back to that in an era when, you know, we're bombarded by information outputs, our cell phones, uh, notifications on our computers, uh, billboards, I mean, social media, you, you pick it. Storytelling mm -hmm. is perfectly designed for the 21st century because it allows us to make sense of all this crazy noise that's going on around us. Right. Um, so, you know, I, we, we're getting a couple of comments out here. I think Lynette and Gretchen both have joined us. Oh, great. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so your advice for people, you know, for PR professionals who are in, uh, you know, who are entrepreneurs in our segment right now, what would be your best advice to them right now? Uh, Continue to be creative, continue to be positive, and look for your own particular uh, niche that you can pursue. Uh, it's a mistake, and what I've seen over the years, and this is certainly true uh, in PRBI, because you know we have 40 of the greatest small agencies from around the world, from India, from the States, et cetera. Um, the, the agencies that succeed, uh, right. Boutique agencies are those that understand what makes them different and they continue to go back to that again and again and again. Generalist mm -hmm. firms typically have a harder time being successful as entrepreneurial firms. Correct. So Lynette has an interesting question for you. Uh, you've been a past president uh, and could you talk a little more about why your firm is a member at PRBI? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so we joined PRBI in 2010, um, and as you just mentioned, over the course of time, I've been the membership committee chair, I've been the secretary, I've been, I'm now the treasurer, uh, I've been the vice president, I've been the president, um, a number of other ad hoc roles. Uh, right. A small firm is great for many of the reasons we talked about today. A global mm -hmm. agency network is great because when you put together the brain power of all of those creative and innovative small firms across the globe, you can really come up with some fantastic ideas. And I have to say, you know, for instance, in the coronavirus uh, epidemic, uh, you know, different countries are at different stages of this. And we do all agency calls at least four times a year. Now we're doing them on Zoom, of course. Uh, and it is just wonderfully helpful to me personally to be able to talk to people in other parts of the globe and to learn, okay, you're a few months ahead of me. What are you experiencing? What's happening there now? Um, and that really produces great ideas. From a more general perspective, Terenji, you know, it's a global society, right? I mean, and you and I, we've talked about this. A lot of the big names uh, in India, uh, historically were American or British companies, right? Now, of course, <laughs> some of the biggest names in American commerce are Indian companies. So, you know, commerce moves back and forth across right. the years very easily. And certainly the digital age and the internet have made that easier. So there's more and more need for collaboration. And that's one of the ways that PRBI is great. That's brilliant. So have you collaborated with any of the member agencies in the past? Yes, I, I have, in fact, and uh, that is a really enjoyable exercise. And in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, PRBI undertook a very interesting project, and we offered to startup companies uh, the equivalent of $50,000 U.S. in uh, PR consultation uh, to help companies who weren't quite financially able yet uh, to hire a, a PR agency. Uh, to do right. that work. And, and we got some amazing applications from around the world uh, for assistance. And we were able to help about four of those companies advance their, their PR uh, prospects. I and, and two colleagues in the States worked with a, uh, a cancer company called Oncoceutics out of uh, Boston to help them advance their story. Uh, they have some uh, drugs that are particularly effective with rare forms of brain cancer. Wow. Um, you, you know, it's uh, we we still get, uh, we're on their list to get all their PR announcements. 
because uh, yeah, they, they've moved on from our assistance project. And it's very rewarding to see how well they're doing and to know that we had a hand in helping them get their messaging and their story to where it is today. So you were excellent PR mentors to them. So I'm sure they learned well. Yeah, they did. They did. They're, they're great people. Wonderful. Uh, so what are future plans for you? Well, so you mentioned the book. The book is uh, in production right now. Um, at the point where there's a couple of uh, illustrations that I'm working with uh, folks to get the rights to, uh, and it'll be over to my consultant who's going to get it into uh, KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, which is a division of Amazon. For anybody out there who wants to know, this is how the world works in the 21st century. Amazon owns book publishing. So whenever you're done with your book, you have to hire somebody who knows how to make sure that it's properly formatted so that it's accepted by Amazon. And that's where mm -hmm. I am right now. Depending upon how long that takes, the book will be out in late September or actually we're shooting for October. Mm -hmm. and, uh, more about the book. Sure. So it's called Finding Your Capital S Story, Why Your Story mm -hmm. Drives Your Brand. So the capital S story is a very specific definition we came up with. We call it the story above all other stories. It's the story about your organization that answers these questions. Why somebody would work for you, buy from you, invest in you, partner with you. If you're an NGO or nonprofit organization, why somebody would donate to you. So if you think about all the stories that an organization could share to us, in our view, the most important story is always that capital S story. And any other smaller story you may share has to tie into that. And the failure that we've seen frequently uh, over the many years we've been doing this uh, with organizations and clients is when they ignore or don't even know what their capital S story is. It's critical to understand. Hmm. But isn't that the essence of every PR agency? They're supposed to let their clients know what their biggest story is, help them discover what the biggest story is. Don't you find that surprising that a lot of people still don't know what it is about? Well, yes, because, and actually, uh, I have a chapter in the book and uh, made the decision that, uh, you know, in marketing the book, we're going to re release some content early, and this will be one of the chapters. It's called Beware the Storytelling Charlatans. So, okay. you know, so there's a lot of people out there in the marketing field, you know, mm -hmm. they really don't care about storytelling. It's just the latest thing for them. They'll go to their website and do a search and replace and replace mm -hmm. last year's favorite word with storytelling. Um, there's other people out there in our business, sadly, who in my, my view are not very honest. And, and I see stories like this all the time of blog right. posts and professional articles where people will say, do you want to convince people to buy things they don't want to buy? Use storytelling. And okay. to me, that's intellectually dishonest. And, uh, you know, there's, there's three levels of storytelling. Capital S storytelling is the simplest and also most strategic. Right. And there are people who are good strategists at the 10,000 foot view, and they'll give you 10 different ways you can share an effective story. Okay, that's right. like saying, um, I can teach you to play the violin, okay? Mm -hmm. Where story crafting is, I can pull the song in your heart out into the world, all right? And then there are people at, at the ground level who are these are the real charlatans. They say, hey, you know, if you stand on the street corner uh, with a kid who has tears on her face and she scratches at a violin, People will throw money in a box. Right. You know? And then, you know, next year we'll come up with something different to try and get people's attention. And I really, you know, find those two other categories of storytelling professionals that I describe uh, to be, um, well, intellectually dishonest. That's just the way it is. I mean, the goal here, people spend money with agencies to get results, right? And so the best results come from your best communication tool, which is your capital S story. And, and you'll see this frequently uh, when people do research of big brands. You know, the brand will say, we want this logo and we want this tagline. And then they go out and they do research and they find out 
that that has nothing to do with why people buy from that company. Correct. And that's because the people who buy from the company have a view and a vision of what the capitalist story is of the organization. Why, why do I buy Apple products? You know, it's not because all of their computers are silver and they have white Apple logos in them, right? Why do I buy Nike products? It's not right. because I like the swoosh, right? It's the story, the story behind what that organization does. What they stand for. Exactly, exactly. But I agree there are, you know, there are one of every kind that exists even in our industry. Uh, and I think a large part of it, uh, large part of the solution is also us because we would be the right people to do PR for PR. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And if each one does their bit, I think there will be at one point, there will be a tipping point where the clients would themselves know the difference between the three categories that you mentioned. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I wrote the book for those uh, chief marketing officers and CEOs who know in their hearts that they have a great story to share, but they, mm -hmm. in working with marketing and PR agencies, have been dissatisfied because they're not getting the kind of results that they believe that they should because right. they, they know in their bones they have this great story to share because their organization is so unique and they're just not getting the results. And I firmly believe the reason for that is that capital S story is not uncovered, developed, and shared, you know, using those three principles, authenticity, fluent storytellers, and engaging the audience in a way right. that produces results. Completely understand. Okay, so your advice for people who want to start an agency at this point? Well, you know, it's very interesting because a lot of folks have compared the current time frame, Terenji, to uh, two uh, events that happened almost 100 years ago. One, is, of course, is the 1918 flu epidemic, but the other is the global Great Depression that happened in the 1930s. And, right. and you know, some of the greatest brands, certainly in American commerce, were actually founded during the Great Depression. Right. And I firmly believe that if somebody's thinking about starting an agency now, there's never been a better time. The rug has been pulled out from, from under everyone. Everything's kind of upside down and topsy-turvy. And that means that there's opportunity there for people willing to take a chance and strike out on their own. Correct. I think out of chaos, there is always a, you know, a, a ray of innovation that comes in. Absolutely. You know, our own firm was founded, you know, as I said, in 2002, uh, in the aftermath of the, the first tech dot com explosion. So that was uh, a period economically nowhere near as bad as what we're in now, but a similar situation, you know, and innovation is the mother of invention, right? I completely understand. I started my agency in 2007, and yeah. that's the time when the Lehman Brothers, uh, you know, crisis happened. There was a huge trickle down in Bangalore, which is an IT hub, and I had a lot of people telling me at that point of time, "Wrong time, get back to a corporate com communication job." But I stuck it out because I believed I had an interesting, uh, you know. Uh, format or interesting storytelling format to offer interesting innovations to offer to my clients. Yes. And, and so, if you, you know, I think throughout human history, if we look back, we see a lot of that. And, you know, I, I'm a big disbeliever in what in the States we call the conventional wisdom. You know, if nine right. people are going to go this way, I'm much more interested in the people going this way. And, you know, the conventional wisdom says that this is a bad time to start a new business. I completely disagree. Let the 90 other people think that it's a bad time to start a business and let those who are truly creative and innovative certainly brought it along by all the terrible things that are happening in the world right now. Let them really, really double up on their innovation and creativity and go out there and do something great. I completely agree. I think this is a time creativity and innovation will get noticed. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, being in a tech center, I'd be interested in your perspective on this. But, you know, I feel we talked about webinars today and some other digital things. I mean, those aren't completely new ideas, right? 
But what's happened is this coronavirus, this global pandemic has pushed forward, has advanced innovations mm -hmm. that were kind of just moseying along, you know, not moving along as fast as, as they could. And, so, and I think that's really another opportunity here. You know, interestingly, when you say that, I would like to mention that though uh, we are a tech hub here in Bangalore, uh, we have been pushing or talking about uh, digital PR for the longest amount of time. I think, like you said, it's just been moseying around, you know, yeah, it's nice to have digital PR, but I need the traditional, I need the print coverage out there. I think this pandemic has literally been like a kick in the butt for a lot of clients where they've, you know, fast tracked and understood what digital PR actually is. And are now the ask has changed and they see the value in that. We had been, you know, we've been crying horse and talking about the benefits and the impact that digital PR can have. Everybody now looks at everything on their phones. We need to be there. Yes. But huge amount of ego PR or fluff PR that was, you know, uh, attached to traditional media. But it's changing now. It's been like a sea change happening out there. And people are consuming more information, whether it's through webinars, live sessions, or traditional guys exploring, uh, you know, even Instagram lives I've seen them do which is very surprising. We would have never seen that happen if the pandemic hadn't happened. Well, exactly. And so, again, that's another example, I think, of the acceleration of a trend that was already underway before the pandemic happened. So mm -hmm. um, we talked a little bit about traditional media. You know, it, in the States, it, it really has shrunk quite a bit. And uh, the demands on, on journalists today because of the coronavirus are worse, worse than ever. Uh, media outlets are closing, people are being laid off. So you have to become your own publisher. So, so here we are as PRBI, we are doing our own Facebook Live. We're a publisher. Uh, you know, right. in our firm, we started the Pittsburgh 100, as you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. which when we debuted was uh, uh, twice, uh, 24 times a year, every other week, uh, e -zine. We're now up to 46,000 subscribers. And, uh, but, you know, our clients' great stories because of what's happening with traditional media, they can't be shared that way solely. We need to get them out there directly. And as you pointed out, we even started a podcast. And mm -hmm. that's another way for us to be out there using digital PR means to get the stories of our clients out there. So can you help me understand or identify one thing, you know, that has, that the pandemic has accelerated and uh, made sure that the clients are more accepting about it? Uh, yes. So, you know, just to kind of continue what I was just saying, you know, the idea of doing things on your own rather than relying on another organization, you know, whether it's an association to hold an event in person that can't be held anymore, or whether it's a media outlet to sure. uh, you know, share your story. Becoming more directly involved in sharing your story is sort of an overall trend that I think clients are much more open to today. Because if they don't do it themselves, nobody else will. No, that's, uh, I think that's a very valid point. And uh, we, from our end, have had to, you know, kind of change the kind of proposals that we are sending out. Uh, it's less dependent on external media, more dependent on owned media. Yes. Uh, and I think that's a good shift that's happening out there. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And in fact, uh, there's uh, another leader in the, in the industry here in the States, uh, Jenny Dietrich, who... Uh, runs a very popular blog called Spin Sucks. Right. And she came up with this uh, concept for digital PR she calls PESO, uh, not the Mexican currency, but it stands for paid, earned, yep. shared, and owned. And that is the model of PR that we practice at, at our firm. Um, had good conversations with Jenny. She's a, uh, a very smart and innovative thinker in the business. And, and this is what clients need to do. They need to be willing to do some level of paid activity, which is almost always digital, earned as traditional PR, shared as social media, and owned, as you just mentioned. You know, that's your website, that's blogs, that's podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. And for success, every client that we work with needs to be involved 
at some level in one of those four areas. Two things we found, Karen G, nobody is, you know, no, no client has 25% in each of the four categories. And no client can afford to have 100% in only one category. Paid, shared, and owned. Some mix of that for every client is appropriate. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. Exactly right. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, as we talked about earlier today, that's where a lot of agencies are going to fail. Because if you view yourself strictly as a media relations shop and you're only hanging mm -hmm. yourself on the E and peso, you're, you're in severe danger of becoming irrelevant. True, true. I think agencies also have to adapt and, you know, pick up the peso model if they haven't already and uh, get with the program. Yes, 100% mm -hmm. agree. Okay, so last question. Uh, we're running out of time. I didn't realize that it's almost about to be an hour now. Uh, if you were not a PR entrepreneur, who would you be now? Oh, wow. Well, when, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be a jet fighter pilot. <laughs> There's still some attraction to that for me, All, although the planes are a little too complicated and too fast today. I, I don't. I don't know about that. I actually was studying to be a professional musician uh, while really? I was in high school. Yes, I I I, I played the tuba uh, of all things, and uh, was studying with a guy in the symphony. And um, I my parents convinced me to put that aside for a more lucrative career. I became a journalist instead. So, you know, <laughs> I, I still still have uh, my horn and. Uh, I've played music throughout the years. That's been a lot of fun. And I imagine, you know, in the future, I'll do more of that. Brilliant. Uh, so that's an alternate career waiting for you. Yes. Yeah. Any parting shots for our viewers? I want to thank everybody who's uh, been watching us live today. And I certainly want to thank those who will watch us as uh, time shifted consumption later when uh, we, we blast this out on social media. If you are a PR professional or a PR agency looking for a great network, you know, please visit us at prboutiques.com to learn more about membership. Uh, we'd love to have you. And, and certainly if you're interested in more of what we do at my firm, our web address is word as in what we speak, write as in what we do with a pen, PR as in publicrelations.com, wordwritepr.com. Brilliant. Thank you so much for taking out the time today, Paul, to speak to all of us. Really appreciate all the insights that you've shared today. Thank you, Taranjeet. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. So that was Paul Furiga, President and Chief Storyteller of WordRight PR, speaking to us about entrepreneurship in PR and lots of good advice on how to make a great story. Thank you so much for joining us today for the session. We will see you again at our next live session with another interesting conversation on PR. Stay tuned.